Welcome from Acorn Energy Co-op and Bristol Community Solar. While we're waiting for people to file in, um, we'll wait a little bit and then we'll begin to show a video of the solar construction project. Looking west, here we are at the Bristol landfill site prior to solar array construction. Looking west again, you can see the access road and here is the construction staging area where equipment is being staged. At the top of the array, you can see racking starting to be assembled. These are form pans for the ballasted blocks that support the array. They function as the foundation because foundation piles cannot be driven into the landfill because the landfill cap cannot be penetrated. The crushed stone under the ballast pans allows us to level the pans. Here you have details of the pans as they're partially assembled, now with racking being assembled into the pan. The concrete will be poured into the pan and cast that vertical posts of the racking into the concrete. You can see how the posts go into the pan where the concrete will be poured. Now that we have some racking showing here, it's ready for being poured. And these are poured ballast blocks. Now, solar panels are being installed once the concrete is cured onto the racking. The racking assembly and the module installation were done in parallel to speed up the construction process. More modules being installed. and a good view of the size of the array. This is looking south and now west and now northwest and looking north. Here's detail of the underside of the array. You can see that the solar panels don't have a white backing. They actually are able to capture sun energy from behind the array as well as the front, because they are bifacial solar panels. This is the view of the backstop at the baseball diamond and its relation to the community. Um, well, welcome everyone. My name is Susan Smiley. I'm part of the Acorn Solar Team, and I'd like to welcome you here to our celebration of the completion of the Bristol Community Solar Project. In the next hour, you'll hear from a number of speakers and enjoy two videos of the project, one showing the construction process, which we just saw, and we'll see again at the end, and another showing the completed project. If you have questions, please write them in the Q&A section of the Zoom screen, and you'll see the icon for that in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we can at the end of the hour. And now I'd like to introduce Ben Marks, president of Acorn Energy Co-op. Greetings. Um, it's always a, a pleasure to be speaking when the subject is congratulations, and there's a, the danger of self-congratulation, but um, I have to say it is wonderful to be here. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, about 10 years ago, um, there were, I think it was fair to, to characterize um, solar development at this scale as something of a fight between developers and towns. Um, and there were often uh, mismatches between uh, site selection and uh, community engagement which led to uh, quite a bit of, of conflict about how solar was gonna be rolled out and how we were gonna change our grid. And uh, our project, uh, I wanna say flies in the face of that, but presents a, a different potential model where you have communities um, uh, and owners coming together to, to work in concert 
uh, to help preserve the environment and to transform both the ownership of these kinds of uh, green assets and um, and our state's our state's grid. So uh, with that, I'm just going to give 30 seconds on our own history and then acknowledge a couple of people uh, and entities without whom this project could not have happened. Um, the Acorn Energy Co-op is a member-owned co-op. We um, started off as the Energy Committee of the Addison County Relocalization Network, which focused on um, uh, local food consumption issues and becoming locally sustainable in terms of food consumption. Um, we spun off that idea um, to encompass energy consumption with the idea of um, having the energy that we consume in Addison County be uh, locally generated. Um, and our, our early efforts had to do with um, uh, Vermont harvested uh, fuel pellets and that sort of thing. Um, but a couple of years ago, thanks to um, some financial engineering genius from Rich Carpenter, who appears on your screen, uh, we figured out a model that allowed um, local businesses and um, local off-takers of, of energy to benefit together. Um, and uh, those of you who are investors um, who also deserve special recognition um, know a little bit about that. Um, in six years, uh, when the tax credits from this project um, have been used by a, a local company to shield their own uh, profits, um, you all, the off-takers, will be the owners of this. So unlike um, large projects that you drive by that are owned by a, a faceless corporation someplace, um, this array is ultimately going to be owned by the people who are benefiting from it. And we feel very, very good about that. Um, it's often said that uh, success has many fathers. And um, I, I just want to uh, take a moment to recognize one woman who is as much the mother of this project as anything else. Um, it's true that many, many people worked on this, uh, pulling in the same direction to make it happen. But without uh, Sally Burrell, there's really no way that uh, we would have known about it. Um, she was the, the local member of the Bristol Energy Community uh, Committee who came to us and suggested that uh, she had a site in mind that was really a, a quadruple win all the way around uh, Brownfield's reuse of a site that was already not visible from anybody's home um, in a way, and using it in a way that could benefit the town, um, not just with tax, but with rent payments. Um, and, and really sort of uh, rolled out the red carpet for us to come and present our model to the town. So um, Sally had a, a pretty steep learning curve, I think, to figure out how we did what we did. But at every step of the way, she's been there um, suggesting um, simpler and more direct ways to uh, try to sell the project to people and explain uh, what we are um, and, and uh, how we do what we do. Um, so, Sally, you're top of the list, and uh, thank you. Without your recognizing this opportunity, really none of us uh, would be here um, today. Uh, there are also a number of, of other entities that are um, intimately involved in this behind the scenes, and they'll, they'll never get written up in the newspaper for it, so I want to talk a bit about them, uh, too. Um, first is Co-op Insurance, um, who's our Series A member. Um, they are the entity that provided the seed capital for this, um, and they, in exchange, are taking the tax credits for the project. But in case you think that they are simply in this for the dough, um, when we ran into supply chain issues um, and needed cash to uh, uh, purchase the panels, literally, they were in a loading dock in California and needed to get here um, and couldn't get here without um, payment of cash. They said, why don't you consider our investment uh, an early bridge loan? Um, and advanced us money at the, the lowest allowable rates um, in order to free up those panels. So it's also true to say that without them, uh, I don't think we could have as easily gotten over this, this hurdle. Um, and, and there were hundreds of those kinds of speed bumps along the way. Um, so Co-op Insurance gets a huge shout out. Um, they're benefiting from this, but they're also uh, enabling it in a way that um, I doubt they would blow their own horn and tell you. So um, it's, it's worth acknowledging them here. Um, also our builder Aegis, um, represented here by Nils Bean. Um, this is the, the second project that he's done uh, with us and we with him. And it's, it's fair to say that because of our financial model, uh, Nils and his crew have to sharpen their pencils even before they fire up their skid steers uh, to get something like this done. Um, there's no way we could have done this with a conventional builder who said, sure, uh, I'll build you anything. Just give me a check for the, the construction price and we're off to the races. Um, so really, um, Aegis uh, 
renewable energy is the entity that is making this happen. And, um, you know, they, they were um, key to our, both our, our solid and open relationship with the town during construction um, and to actually getting the, the project built as you saw. I probably run over my time, uh, but I also wanna talk about the National Bank of Middlebury who made special low interest financing available to people who wanted to invest in this um, and the town of Bristol itself um, in the form of Valerie Caples, um, who've really been an outstanding partner. And no matter whether the news on my end of the phone was good or bad, uh, we're always list willing to listen and work through a problem. Um, and I, I mention all these people because uh, I think what our model um, provides is a, um, a way to move forward. A, a lot of us ask, you know, how do you transform the energy infrastructure of a state like Vermont, um, where at the same time, we're progressive and want renewable energy, but we're also conservative and don't want anything to change. Um, and our, our answer to that is uh, with openness and cooperation and uh, uh, doing a lot of advanced work to talk people through a, a project with good site, site selection, which brings me back to Sally. Um, and then finally, with the investment of our Series B members, who really, without you, this project would have never happened. Um, you're a remarkable group because you all had to say yes to this, um, not just in a way that uh, made it clear you would uh, uh, benefit in terms of your families and your businesses and your organizations, uh, but also that you believed in this kind of uh, cooperative uh, venture. Um, you're going to be the owners and uh, you will be running this thing um, in six years or hiring us to run it, perhaps. <laughs> we'll see. Um, so welcome all. Um, sorry for going over my time. It's wonderful to see you here. And uh, uh, just a huge, huge uh, shout out to all of you for helping to make this happen. Thanks, Ben. I'd like to introduce now Lee Dalgowitz, who is the CEO of Cooperative Insurance, who will be speaking to us via video. Good afternoon. My name is Lee Dogwitz, and I'm the president and CEO of Cooperative Insurance Companies based in Middlebury, Vermont. First, I want to apologize for not being able to share this message to you live, as I did for the previous Acorn Renewable Energy Co-op project we participated in in Shoreham. I do want to congratulate the Acorn folks, as well as the Bristol community specifically, for their contributions on this project which will bring all Vermonters one step closer to achieving the state's goal of 90% renewable energy by 2050. In addition, with the ongoing COVID pandemic significantly affecting supply chains and building projects of all sizes, it is a testament to the hard work and dedication of the ACORN and Aegis Renewable Energy folks that this project stayed on track and on time. Finally, as the sole A investor in this project, I am proud Cooperative Insurance Companies was able to provide the financial resources when they were most needed to bring this latest project to fruition. Thank you for being a part of the celebration and we wish you all good health, peace and prosperity in the new year. Thank you, Lee. Next, I'd like to introduce Nils Bain, a CEO of Aegis Renewable Energy, our project contractor. Thank you, Susan. Uh, again, my name is Nils Bain Aegis, from Aegis Renewable Energy. I'm the founder and CEO. Uh, we've had a great and long relationship with ACORN, and we're very proud to have been uh, such a trusted partner with, with such an amazing group of individuals who are, are uh, forwarding in mo a model for community solar in Vermont that is has long been needed and is really a, a fantastic model for the rest of the state to emulate. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to spend my time uh, to give you all some perspective on the scale of what you all as members have achieved here. So the project itself is 745,000 watts. Uh, there are 122 residents um, and municipalities and businesses that are members of the project. Um, and the project sits on roughly three acres of undevelopable landfill uh, that ha would have no other uh, purpose within the community um, other than just to sit there um, as a former landfill. Uh, there are 1,694 solar panels in the array, 
And if you were to walk along the length of the rows of the solar panels, you would be on a more than a half a mile walk to get from one end of the array to the other, walking along each row of the array. Uh, there are nearly 10, 10 miles of wire in the project and 178 ballast blocks uh, in the uh, array. The, the project was energized on December 22nd. Um, and to get, let's give you some perspective now on the environmental impact that this project has. I think that's something that we all hold very near and dear to our hearts. We wanna know that what we're doing here has a real and positive impact for the planet. So uh, it, this project on an annual basis will offset 1, 300, roughly 1,328,000 pounds of CO2. Um, that's equivalent to 1,500,000 miles of driving, 665,800 pounds of coal burned, 80, uh, 68,000 gallons of gasoline. Um, it would take 738 acres of forest to sequester the equivalent carbon as what this uh, project is offsetting. So it's something that we can all be very, very proud of. Uh, right now, I'd like to have us uh, move on to the completed construction um, drone video. Uh, so you can all get a uh, perspective of what's been completed here. Thank you. What a splendid video, and thank you, Nils. I'd like to just interject a little, another reminder that qu questions and can be asked by um, putting them in the Q&A section of, uh, in the lower right-hand corner of your video screen. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Sally Burrell from Bristol and the Bristol Energy Committee. Thank you so much. Um, I reached out to ACORN in early 2020 drawn by their unique model. And now solar ownership is a reality for many residents who were previously hindered by shade or cost or roof angle. So it feels great to finally allow people in Bristol and beyond to um, become owners of solar. They're gonna save money over time and they're contributing to Vermont's renewable energy future. This array helps Bristol meet one of our enhanced energy plan goals too, for siting renewable energy. And also the annual lease payments to the town will help offset Bristol's landfill monitoring costs. Luckily for us, ACORN is a volunteer organization. Hundreds of hours, maybe even thousands have been given to this project by Peter, Susan, Rich, Ben, Tom, and Greg. And Mary Mester, ACORN's amazing coordinator, is the only person paid in the group. All are incredibly talented and fun to work with. And it's been a pleasure, total pleasure. And we're deeply grateful for their dedication to Bristol Community Solar and to sustainability for communities in general. Thanks. Thank Susan, you. Susan, I wonder if I could interject. Yes. Mari, Mari indicated that she's going to have to leave soon. Could mm. we 
Could we yes. slide her in? Okay. Um, uh, can we slide her in? Yes, we can. All she has to do is to speak. I'm, I'm introducing Mari Cordes. She's um, a, a state representative from the district that includes Bristol, New Haven, Lincoln, Starksboro, and Moncton. Mari. Thank you so much. And I apologize for having to, to take cuts. I'm so, I'm, as you can see, at, at work at the hospital today, um, but I'm very grateful that I can, can participate and hear um, all of the, the wonderful stories and information that um, led to, to this. Um, as, and I don't represent New Haven as much as I would love to, um, just Lincoln, Bristol, oh. Moncton, and Starksboro. <laughs> that's, that's okay. <laughs> Um, this project um, is exactly uh, the kind of group effort that I know is going to help Vermont succeed. The, I love working in the legislature and working with all of you um, to make um, progress on the climate crisis, but legislation policymaking is, is slow. Um, so my when there's so many things to uh, have to struggle to maintain hope around this and the community work together, the collective work is exactly what, what gives me hope. So I'm so grateful. I'm so impressed. I'm so proud. And I can't wait to continue to work with you. And lastly, um, I'm on the leadership team of the Legislative Climate Solutions Council. And I'd like to suggest um, to our leadership team um, that uh, we have a presentation from Bristol about this project. I think it would inspire um, other legislators and their constituents. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mari. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Porter Knight. Porter's a Bristol resident and an investor in Bristol Community Solar. Thank you, Susan. Um, I'm really happy to speak about this great community project. Um, firstly, as a Bristol resident, I'm thrilled to have been able to buy into Bristol Community Solar. We really wanted to move solar, but as Sally said, we have a small shaded village lot and we have an historic house with a slate roof and not much Southern exposure. So this was exactly what we needed. Um, but also as a board member for the Bristol Recreation Club, we also were interested in solar, but we didn't wanna take away any field space at the Bristol Recreation Park to dedicate to that. And so this opportunity was great for our little nonprofit as well. As a community member, I'm really pleased to see the solar array on top of the closed landfill. It's just an excellent use of that space. It's not in a highway or a residential view shed. It's not prime agricultural land. Um, really, I was, I was excited about that. And as coordinator of the Bristol Trail Network, we were really grateful to ACORN um, who collaborated with us early on to make sure that the Bristol Trail in that area could coexist really nicely with this new solar array. And I think it's a terrific opportunity to showcase our community's commitment to alternative energy. In fact, uh, looking at the videos today and listening to Nils talk, um, I'm gonna follow up. I wanna capture some of that video and his remarks to put on a QR code on a sign along our trail segment there so that people can really learn about you know, what's going on and what the environmental benefits of this project are. Overall, I just feel like Bristol Community Solar has really manifested the community aspect of their name and I'm really pleased to be a part of it. Great, Porter, thanks. Congressman Peter Welsh um, from the US Congress has sent us a video, congratulations. We're going to listen to that now. Congratulations to everyone involved in the success of Bristol Community Solar. This is tremendous. 122 residents will be getting their electricity through the power, the renewable power of the sun. Also, the money is gonna be saved and kept in the community. Good for Bristol, good for the residents. Also, you made a really wise decision to locate this on a former brownfield, the landfill. That's a really good reuse of land. And what I find so inspiring is the community and its partners did this together, establishing what we all know is true. Much more is achieved through cooperation than conflict. So congratulations to a job well done and may many more communities emulate what you have accomplished. Thank you, Congressman Wells. I'd like to introduce Ruth Hardy now. She's the state Senator from Addison County. Thank you, Susan. Um, and thank you to everyone for inviting me to share in this celebration. It's 
really wonderful to see all of your faces on the screen and to all those who are not on the screen, thank you for coming to celebrate this. What we can't see on the screen is that it's a gorgeous sunny day, um, a perfect day for um, celebrating a new solar energy project. And I really wish we could all be together in person at the site to really enjoy the, the, the perfect, um, perfect perfection of it all um, together. Um, I'm, uh, as Susan said, State Senator Ruth Hardy. I represent all of Addison County plus Huntington and Buell's Gore. So I could not be more proud of Bristol and my entire community for making this happen. Um, a special shout out certainly to Sally, um, who I've known for several years now and is truly a community gem. So thank you, Sally, for your efforts. And congratulations to everybody. Acorn Energy, Aegis Renewable Energy, all the investors, um, the National Bank of Middlebury, uh, Co-op Insurance, um, the 122 investor members. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting someone. It's hard to make a list and then realize you might forget someone. So thank you and congratulations to everybody um, who has worked on this project. It's truly creative and community-based, and that's the amazing thing, as we've heard from a number of people already. And this is one of the reasons why I love representing Addison County, is I feel like across the board, our county, our communities, our people come together and find creative, um, really determined um, uh, solutions to really tough problems. Um, the videos show what a beautiful project it is too. I think solar panels are gorgeous and it's really pretty um, to see them embedded in our community and reusing as people have said, a space that couldn't be used for anything else. Um, I think it's, it's definitely a model for community renewable energy. And I do hope that we share it um, in the um, legislative uh, uh, caucus, uh, as well as across our community. There's another recently closed landfill in Addison County that maybe could be used for the same purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and this, as you all know, is more important than ever now. Um, in 2020, the legislature passed the Global Warming Solutions Act, um, which created the uh, Vermont Climate Council. And many of the goals that we had previously are now actually requirements and that we need to meet them or there will be consequences. And so a project like this helps us meet those goals and helps us create a better future for our communities and for our world. Um, as the mother of three kids who remind me pretty much every day that um, their future is dependent on our ability to find creative solutions like this. Um, I just wanna thank you on behalf of the next generation and make sure that we're leaving them a world where they can live for into the future in a clean environment and a healthy planet. So congratulations to everyone. And thank you so much for including me in this incredible celebration. Thank you, Senator Hardy. Uh, Caleb Elder is with us today. He's the rep uh, state, Vermont State Representative um, from uh, Bristol, Lincoln, Starksboro, and Moncton. Um, would you um, speak now, Caleb? Thanks. Absolutely, Susan. Yeah, thanks for having me. And for I'm seeing this event and, and thanks everyone involved. Uh, congratulations are definitely in order. This is an exciting day and a nice sunny day as Senator Hardy mentioned, so I'm sure the meter's cranking. Um, I agree with so much of what's been said. This is a, an exercise in innovation on the financing side um, and that's appropriate with solar. You know, so much of the um, permitting that we've done in Vermont over the past couple decades has been innovative and has allowed our brave little state, but sometimes a gray little state, not the sunniest place in the world, you know, not the Sonoran Desert, has allowed our state to really be a leader um, in a lot of ways around solar. And I think this is another great example of that. Um, I'm so happy for the physical proximity to the high school. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that because I think that our kids need to see this work. They need to see it up close. They need to be curious about, hey, what's that over there? Uh, I'm sure there's some protective fencing or something, but still, <laughs> hopefully opportunities come from proximity, right? And uh, as a kid who grew up in Bristol, wandering uh, off the end of Pine Street to see where all those trails around the dump and the <laughs> Devon O'Lane uh, kind of uh, wind up, 
you, uh, it would have been neat to come across a solar array, I guess is what I'm saying, in a responsible, in a responsible teenage way. But because that, you have to ask questions, right? You have to see this, this stuff. And as we think about applied engineering, as we think about career technology education, I just um, am really pleased with that. I know for the students at Robinson Elementary School who have a 100 kilowatt solar project sort of in their backyard, that has been a, a learning opportunity. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to call that out as well. Um, and say just in closing, thanks for having me. This is this is fun. It's it's great to get together for a good news day, and um, and one that also promises to uh, to have some some repetition of this maybe across our state um, in years to come. So thanks so much. Thanks, Caleb. Uh, Richard Butz uh, from Bristol, um, who's also a member of the Interfaith Climate Action Network and the Vermont, uh, Vermont Interfaith Power and Light Organization will, um, will speak now and introduce us to several other um, uh, associates of his. Thanks, Susan. People of all faith traditions around the world understand that it is our role to be what some express as stewards of creation and that we are to work for the common good. Two organizations, the Addison County Interfaith Climate Action Network, known as ICANN, and Vermont Interfaith Power and Light were formed to galvanize people of all faith traditions to advocate and act to address the causes of climate change. Knowing that community solar projects reduce fossil fuel use, these two organizations work to encourage our members to participate in them. And Reverend Barnaby Feeder, pastor of the Champlain Valley Unitarian Universalist Society will offer a blessing on behalf of all people of faith. Thank you, Richard. Praise song for this day. Spirit of life-giving love, today we celebrate gratefully and with hope for a bright future, the Bristol Community Solar Field, where once we gathered refuse, now we have composed a new story of human ingenuity, labor, and neighborly commitment to repair our relations with our Mother Earth. We pause first to honor the Abenaki people. Though oppressed by European colonizers and driven from the land we now occupy, they retained the wisdom of their ancestors, who, like our own, saw divine energy in the sun's light and revered it each day they were blessed to live. We pray our children's children will say, here, come look at where the spirit of life spoke through them of true love for us. And then we go deeper. Praise for the beginning, the original flaring forth, where love was planted among the first elements, setting a star-lit path toward all we know of the universe. Praise for the holy immensity of the sun and the fertile distance at which earth formed to circle it. Praise for the violent birth of the moon, the evolution of earth's protective atmosphere and its ancient cradling seas. Praise for the sacred moment when life on earth began knowing itself blessed and learned to give thanks. Spirit of life-giving love, we bow today to the sun's reliable rise over the green mountains, knowing there has never been a dawn we created. Hear our gratitude for all we have learned of our place in the web of existence. Hear our prayer, you of countless names and none, that we will not falter or rest too long in today's joy. Hear our prayer that you will call us forward, not just to survival, but to justice, compassion, and the courage to serve you well until we too join the ancestors. Thank you so much, Pastor Barnaby. I'd like to introduce now Reverend Abigail Deal Noble, who's pastor of the New Haven Congregational Church. And she's going to tell us about the Innovative Tithe Program and introduce us to the recipient of this tithe program. Thank you, Richard. It is my very great honor to introduce someone I greatly admire and have had the joy of working with on several occasions. 
Dr. Lydia Clements. Dr. Clements is a medical anthropologist whose work includes supporting global health initiatives. But now her life's work encompasses managing the nonprofit that she founded. It's based on her parents' efforts to cultivate in their Vermont family a love of art, heritage, and the land. The Clements Family Farm is a small nonprofit that in a few years that it's existed has created enormous reach in Vermont and as a model beyond Vermont. Its twin missions include art and agriculture, both very dear to us in Vermont. The Clements Family Farm seeks to preserve and bring into the future the arts traditions of the African diaspora and to educate people about the rare treasure of black owned farmland in Vermont. I am here today on behalf of the Interfaith Climate Action Network. We are a group in Addison County motivated by our faith traditions to mitigate the effects of climate change. And we've been involved in the last several years as a partner with ACORN in supporting solar projects in Addison County. We've taken on the particular role of encouraging churches and individuals in faith communities to live out their faith by investing in solar power, especially in local solar power. A special component that we've brought to ACORN's projects is when faith communities and individuals who are part of them invest in these projects, they're invited to offer a tithe, a 10% donation. And that donation goes towards helping a nonprofit achieve solar capacity when it might otherwise not have the budget to do so or to do so soon. We in the I can network see in the Clements family farm the same combination of a love of our shared history and a hope for the future that is so intrinsic to our mission. We are so glad today to present Dr. Clements representing Clements family farm with the donation of solar power on behalf of all of our faith communities and in gratitude for the arts, racial justice, and agricultural missions that they bring to our state. Dr. Clements. Reverend Abigail, thank you so much. Um, I'm just, I have to just take a beat because I'm speechless uh, really by the beauty of what you've just said, really, really touched. And your words take me back to the email I received or the phone call when we received the news of the tithing and this phenomenal gift, this gift of love and this gift of community that literally came for us out of nowhere. Um, the Clemens Family Farm is uh, a new nonprofit, as, as uh, Reverend Abigail said. We were just founded in 2019 with my parents. It was not my own initiative, it was really with my parents. And, but we're building on a 60-year legacy of love and commitment to the community. That 60-year legacy is my parents' legacy. They purchased a beautiful farm in Charlotte, Vermont, um, arrived here as one of the few African-American couples or families in the in the area and whether they wanted to or not they were immediately embraced by the community um, my dad was all gung-ho my mother was a bit skeptical when she arrived in the 1960s she'd never lived in a white community uh, she had her you know questions about what it would be like living with and working with and communing with white folks and had no choice but to fall in love with the community there was such warmth and outreach at the time. I was an infant at the time. But remember growing up in, in a community where the farm and our African-American identities were central, something created by my parents um, that brought the community in and then also brought us kids, the family, out to the community as one of the few African-American families in the area. And yes, the farm, the art, the history, the heritage were all integral to our childhood growing up here. 
I returned from a 35 year career in Africa as a medical anthropologist to help my parents figure out how to save the legacy and this farm and to continue building on the hope, as you had mentioned, of what a multicultural community can do together. What we can do as a community when we approach each other with love, the joy of discovery at being different. And so we did found the nonprofit with a three part mission. The first part is preserving this unique historic farm, one of 0.4% of farms in the nation that is African American owned, preserving it as a safe environment for black people, black artists, and for a community. It's rare, whether you're black, white, pink, or purple, to come to a space that's actually owned and stewarded by black people. To experience that is a treasure. It's a joyful experience. I think anyone who's visited this farm understands how joyful and unique it is to be on this property, held and loved by black people. The second part of our mission is the work we're doing with a growing network of Vermont's artists of African descent. We have about 250 now in our network. Um, and we work with these artists in collaborating around community-based art projects. We offer professional development opportunities. We offer just the opportunity to get together and network because it's so rare for black artists to know each other or to have a place to create together. The third part of our mission is again, deeply uh, important to my parents, building a loving and supportive multicultural community. So again, using the, the space, the arts, the farm, the ability to come together across our differences of race and culture and build a community that is multicultural and joyful about those differences is the third part of our mission. I think that the work that the Bristol Solar community has done with ICANN and ACORN is exactly the kind of community we are so proud to be part of. Um, the mission and the, the fact that you've reached out to us in this way and supported us is so touching and so inspiring for us. And I think that the work that is going on is an innovative model for everybody. Um, I'm so inspired myself and again, so grateful to be part of this, you know, on the receiving end and hopefully we'll be able to give back through the solar power uh, contributions by offering once the pandemic is over, more community building experiences on the farm, bringing people together across our differences and really diving into the arts, history and culture. Thank you all so much for this opportunity. And it's really been a joy to listen to all of the other uh, panelists and to be part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. And thank you for, for the history of the farm and, and all the wonderful things that are, have happened and are happening there. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Richard Carpenter. Richard is uh, a part of the Acorn Solar team and he'll be talking to us about back to the more mundane, I think, um, but signage around the solar solar array and and some interesting information about your ability as as subscribers to to monitor the production uh, from your computers or phones. Hi everyone. Um, this is a. I think you may be seeing something with, there. This is a mock-up of a sign that will uh, be uh, erected uh, either right next to the playing field in Bristol or perhaps down by the uh, where the telephone or the, the power poles are. We haven't finalized the location yet, but it's intended to hopefully be there for many, many years to come. Um, and the QR code at the bottom right will point people to a place on our website that, among other things, will have uh, copies of the videos that you've seen of the construction process, uh, as well as, uh, at least in the short term, uh, a copy of uh, the video of today's uh, presentation. It also highlights the partners that you've uh, heard about uh, several times today. Uh, in addition, we'd hope to be able to actually show you uh, some type of graphic showing the, particularly today, the, the amount of uh, kilowatt hours that are being generated with this glorious sunshine. Uh, that isn't quite 
uh, ready yet, but uh, we will make a link to that available to all of our Series B members, and that too will be on the uh, ACORN website. So uh, these are two things to come. We'll send a copy of this sign once it's absolutely finalized to all of our uh, Series B investors as well. Thanks. Back to you, Susan. Thanks, uh, Tom Dunn, another member of our Acorn Solar team, will talk to us now about um, what we can look forward to now that um, in terms of actions and, and prospects, um, now that power is flowing from the, from the project. Hi, I'm Tom Dunn, member of the solar, uh, Acorn Solar team. As you already know, the electrons started flowing to the GMP grid on December the 22nd. So what happens next? This month, you will receive your first credits on your GMP bill. If you look at the back side, you'll see how they're broken out. They will be relatively small due to the winter reduction in sunlight. Uh, we have a graph showing 10 years experience. Uh, if you could put that up, Rich. This shows the uh, production for 10 years of our first solar project. And you can see that in January, February, and December, the numbers are quite low as compared to March through um, October, say. Um, so it, it could be five times as much power generated during the summer months as during the winter months. So what happens uh, with this uh, seasonal variance, uh, you, will, you will get your BCS, your Bristol Community Solar shares will build up more credits during the, um, the summer, spring, and fall months than, than, than you will actually use. So GMP will bank the surplus uh, for later usage in the winter months when you aren't producing as much. You, know, uh, you must note also that some charges on your bill can't be erased by the solar uh, credits. And those are called the non-bypassable charges. In my particular case, they average 25 to $35 a month. Everyone's, use, everyone's individual uh, amounts will vary, but they're also listed on the back of your bill. So you don't have anything to, else to do, uh, worry about for a year until uh, next January, you'll get a invoice for your share of the uh, expenses incurred during the year that need to be repaid, which will be about one third, approximately one third of the credit you receive during the year. That's it. The same cycle then repeats year after year, hopefully without any interruptions. So now um, I'll turn the pro program back to Rich uh, to, for the Q and A part. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, there are some uh, very good questions uh, that have been submitted. Uh, I'm going to uh, read the question and then ask one of the other panelists or uh, other members of the um, ACORN Solar team to uh, respond. So the first one is from Bob West. On a day like today, how much electricity does each panel produce? Nils, you want to handle that? Sure. Uh, so on a good sunny cold day like today, you actually have uh, some really good energy collection opportunities. Um, in winter, we also have to contend with solar uh, snow on the solar array. So in this case, though, we don't have snow on the array. Um, each solar panel is 440 watts. Um, and uh, so if that is producing full power, um, for say uh, ten hours, you could look. You you that would be four point four kilowatt hours per per day for that solar panel. But that's really not what you'll be seeing in the winter time. On in in general, that would be under perfect uh, conditions. Thanks, Nils. Uh, an anonymous uh, question: Looks like some panels are casting shadows on panels behind them. Nils, while well, you're up. <laughs> Maybe you can sure. Yeah, so that that is the case. Um, it, it, 
the there were constraints in terms of space available uh, to be able to fit the full system size on the array. So uh, one of the ways that we are mitigating the impact of that is we've wired up all of the top row of solar panels completely separately from the bottom row. So you don't have any impact of shading on the bottom row impacting the upper row of solar panels. Um, so that's one way. And then the other, the other thing that we've done is we've, we've used, uh, opted to use what are called bifacial solar panels. So these solar panels um, collect energy on the front of the solar panel, but they also collect reflected light um, off of the snow and the panels behind them uh, that reflects back to the back side of that solar panel. So we get additional gains from that. Um, now, because the sun is so low on the horizon this time of year, that's why you're seeing shadow cast onto the, the back row. Um, in the summertime, that won't be a problem because there is enough spacing between the rows to, um, to make sure that the, uh, the, the, the shadow is not casting onto the back rows. Okay, thanks, Nils. Uh, another uh, question, um, somewhat similar. Uh, during the second drone video, there were shadows cast from an array row onto the next array row. Clearly the drone shots were taken while the sun was low. With that said, what portion of the day are shadows cast by one array row onto another row? Yeah, so that again is um, seasonally, um, dependent. Uh, in During the winter solstice, you know, December 21st and this time of year, um, you're going to see more of that shading impact. And uh, that actually um, is, an, is, a, is part of the reason why in that graph th that uh, Tom and, and Rich showed a little while ago, you see winter months, uh, a much more reduced energy production uh, in those winter months compared to the summer months. Um, so again, space constraints, uh, but in the summertime, uh, that, that amount of shading, uh, you won't be seeing uh, any of that shading in the, in the high production summer months. Thanks again, Nils. Uh, this one, I think Rich, this, ben... is, this is Ben, I just wanna jump in with an additional fact. Um, th those of you who are listening closely to Nils's technical description of the project probably noticed that the um, he, he mentioned a a number of uh, of watts that the the project um, is rated at um, as over the 500 kilowatts that um, uh, are the the upper limit for a um, net meter project. One of the things that you do when you're you're sizing a project of this size um, is often um, overrate the DC side of the project um, so that during the winter months, you're going to be closer to your 500 kW peak, which is the, the limit that you can produce under the CPG. So it, it is true that there is some shading, um, but we've tried to, to mitigate that um, due to the, the physical constraints of the land, land uh, parcel that we're on uh, by sizing the project in a way that we, we get close to our maximum output on the uh, maximum number of days per year. So, so it is true that there is some shadow there, but it is also true that um, we're using the parcel about as efficiently as we can. Thanks, Ben. Uh, actually, another question while you're on, Ben. Uh, was the purchase of 15% of the power by Middlebury planned from the beginning, or was it something MID chose to do to help make the project happen? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, we uh, approached Middlebury's energy committee, um, who was evaluating various kinds of uh, possible investments for Middlebury. They thought about building their own solar array, um, but because they're a municipality that doesn't pay taxes, the federal tax credits were really of no help to them. Um, they would have had to found a tax partner to take the federal tax credits, and our project had already dealt with that pretty efficiently. Um, also, the project was going to be located um, outside of Middlebury, and so um, it relieved Middlebury of the, the, the public exercise of trying to figure out um, where they could place an array in town um, that was acceptable to all of their residents. So there were some political problems that our project solved. Um, but the other 
uh, component of this is sort of interesting. Um, I, I think originally when we approached uh, Middlebury, uh, we were in the middle of our sales process and um, homes and businesses and the town of Weybridge had already come in and were sort of buying more units in the pro project um, every week. And Middlebury had its own uh, political process that it had to go through in order to bond uh, the amount of money that they would um, have in, in order to invest in the project. And so they needed us to be flexible in our sales process so that they could go to their voters. Maybe the voters would, would have said, no, we don't want to take out a loan to make this investment, despite the recommendation of the select board. So when we were doing our, uh, our, our marketing, we decided that um, in order to give Middlebury a, a solid number that they could shoot for in their bonding process that we would reserve at the time about 20 percent of the project was still available uh, but more was being sold every week and we we told them that we would reserve 15 percent of the project for them so that they could go to their voters with a specific bond number um, knowing what they were asking for because uh, it was it was two dynamic processes um, that were uh, encountering one another um, I, I would have personally loved it as the president if they'd simply come in and said, hey, we're going to make your project happen. But it, it, uh, these things never work out the way you want them to, although we were very satisfied with the result in the end. Um, Middlebury had a, a robust internal debate about whether this project was right for them. And we attended those meetings and answered questions uh, the best we could. We were thrilled that the voters in Middlebury uh, uh, saw the wisdom of, of this investment and uh, um, and gave their approval to move forward uh, with Middlebury's uh, involvement. Um, so that's the long version of the answer. Uh, the short version is no. <laughs> the long version is um, we got to see a lot of the sausage making uh, up close and personal in terms of Middlebury's uh, political process. Um, and we're very, uh, we, we, were, we were treated um, very well during, during that process um, and were active participants in it. Thanks, Ben. Uh, another question for Nils from Peter McFarland. Uh, some of the rows near the north side are short on the east end. What's the reason for this? Uh, yeah, so uh, we had to, we were constrained by the slopes of the, um, of the ground. So uh, slopes beyond 15% uh, grade, uh, we really couldn't put uh, arrays on. So that's what really constrained the length of, of the rows is the, the topography of the land. Um, it looks fairly flat in the drone video, but it's actually, there's, there's some slope on as you drop off from the top of the cap. Thanks, Nils. Uh, next is a comment from Steve Wisbaum uh, that I'll just read. Well, the greenhouse gas savings and environmental benefits of this project are huge for the fossil fuels that are saved directly by this renewable source of energy. I hope that we can also use the uh, publicity about this project to point out that these benefits will be multiplied many fold for all the internal combustion engines that are replaced with electric vehicles, tractors, lawn care equipment, et cetera, that utilize the electricity produced. Uh, I think I'd say amen to that. I don't know that we need to comment further. Uh, I think- Yeah, just, just uh, back, back to the, the statistic I, I mentioned earlier, 68,000 gallons of gasoline offset per year from this array. So absolutely agree. Great. Uh, there are four more questions. Uh, we're at an hour, but uh, we can go on indefinitely, so feel free. We will show the uh, video again of the construction uh, progress. Uh, uh, from Peter McFarland, did, did Tom say that annual fees will be about a third of the benefits from solar generation? That seems high. Uh, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, yeah, we've uh, throughout the, uh, the marketing process as we've shared the model with everyone, uh, the LLC, which is uh, technically Acorn Energy Solar 3, uh, pays all of the expenses uh, that range from uh, lease payments to the uh, town of Bristol for the land, uh, tax payments, uh, insurance coverage, uh, there are a whole slew of different expenses. And we've roughly assumed uh, that those will be roughly a third of the total. 
the actual amount that's billed to each of you next January and subsequent Januaries will be whatever the expenses were. And to the extent that, uh, you know, we've included some contingency, uh, <laughs> the number of sunny days versus, there's so many factors here. So it won't be exactly a third. It could be more one, some years, it could be less other years. But that, and I guess the key thing to say is that expense amount was factored into the financial uh, return that we uh, suggested that, that you would see, which off the top of my head, I'm not going to quote because I don't remember it exactly, but uh, that return assumed that there would be expenses of this order of magnitude. Rich, uh, Tom here, let me add to it also that that, that money, uh, part of that money goes to uh, building up a fund to pay off a co-op insurance at the end of six, year, six years to buy them out and also to fund uh, later uh, possible uh, inverter uh, replacement costs so that we don't have to all of a sudden come out of pocket on that. And again, we don't know exactly what those costs are going to be, but we're, we're using our best guess uh, to program that in. Thanks, Tom. Very helpful. Uh, next, uh, Sam Swanson said, what's the approximate total annual kilowatt hour output from the 500 kilowatt array? I should know that off the top of my head. Nils, do you know that? <laughs> it's, it's somewhere north of 800,000 kilowatt hours a year. Yeah, thanks. Uh, next, uh, John Quinney says, is it possible to not pay our initial GMP bills knowing that in the summer, we'll be generating more electricity than we use. I'll, I'll take that one. <laughs> Go ahead. So, I, um, what the utility would say is that uh, even though you think that's how your uh, solar production is going to go, um, they still have cash needs to pay their employees and to pay, um, you know, for supplies and materials that are are in dollars. And so, uh, they require you to pay your bill every month, and they're their tariffs really govern what that relationship is. Um, so I would say, um, you know, it, if you don't pay your electric bill, eventually they're going to become very cross and threaten to cut off your, uh, your, your service, which is they're, they're entitled to do that under their tariffs. So I wouldn't advise it. Um, one thing I'll just add to that is that your net metering credits that you, that are generated by your share of the array, um, if you can't use them that month, they roll forward. So it's not like they get wasted. They they roll forward and they'll be applied to your bill as your bill can use them. For, for up to 12 months, right. So for up to 12 months from so the date that they're actually generated. Yes. Yeah. Last question from Ann Wallace, CPG question mark. Uh, the <laughs> short answer, answer is, is <laughs> yes, exclamation point. Uh, <laughs> Certificate of public good. It's the, that's the permit that is uh, achieved to allow the project to be built. And that's a state permit that you get. Right. So um, just a little bit of background. In order to build a project like this, you have to go in front of the uh, Vermont Public Utilities Commission and show by a, a, a civil standard of more likely than not um, a range of, uh, of effects and lack of effects um, for your project. So you have to show that you're not going to have, for instance, an, an adverse effect on historic sites, which we knew we wouldn't because this is a landfill, um, that you're not going to affect the groundwater or um, produced air pollution, which we knew we wouldn't because it's solar, that you're not going to affect endangered species um, or any um, rare, threatened, or endangered uh, plants. Um, and and there, there are about 14 different broad categories and then some, some subcategories that you have to demonstrate. And the certificate of public good is the public utilities uh, commission's um, acknowledgement that you have met your your burden of proof on all of those standards and are now licensed to operate the um, the generating plant that you've asked permission to build. So it's it's our basic permit, and we often shorthand it because we live in this world, um, uh, but we forget that we're sometimes speaking a, a foreign language of acronyms and initialisms. So sorry if that was obscure. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'd like to wrap up before we do the final video just to thank hey, our, Rich. 
Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. This is Ian from Bristol. There was one additional question from Maggie Eaton in the chat. It says, will snow be removed from the panels uh, when it covers the panels? Oh, thank you. Um, I'll do the, the short answer, no. Uh, but the longer answer, uh, <laughs> maybe Nils would like to <laughs> comment on. Sure. Um, so in general, uh, it's, it's not recommended because if you use the wrong implement to clear the snow, you could damage the panels. Um, that said, there are foam brushes that uh, people use uh, sometimes. Uh, and, and honestly, we'll do this, this occasionally if we happen to be at a ground mounted solar array project. Um, we'll actually walk along the bottom, bottom edge of the row um, with a, a soft foam brush and just swipe off the bottom two feet or so of the, uh, the panels. And what happens then is the sun will hit that panel there and start to heat it up because of the dark color of the solar panel. Um, and then you can, in, you can instigate um, some sliding of that snow to come off. You wouldn't want to clear the entire uh, you know, solar array of the, of the snow, but just quickly walking along the bottom edge and pulling off the bottom two feet or so um, actually can, can speed up the process of snow shedding and um, it could help uh, the economics on a project. This is Ben Marks. I'll, I'll just offer a personal uh, story, which is that um, we put in solar panels at our home in the backyard about uh, six years ago. And the first year that we had them, like like any um, owner of a brand new shiny toy, I wanted to see them producing uh, electricity every single day. So the first time we had a really heavy snow, I put on, you know, really heavy gloves that went into my parka and, and tall boots and everything. Thing. And I went out there and I, I worked for about 40 minutes, you know, doing exactly what Nils said, sort of moving snow um, uh, away so that the sunlight could warm the panels and eventually shed them. And when I, I looked at the production for that day, the difference was about 11 cents. And I thought, well, in terms of in terms of the the financial efficacy of all that effort, um, it's really just best to let the sun do, do what it does, which is warm the panels through the snow um, and have the, the snow slough off. Um, in subsequent years, I didn't do it, and I haven't noticed um, any um, particular degradation in terms of the, the power offset. Um, it is the world's most boring machine, um, exciting in its effects, but uh, it just sort of sits there and does what it's supposed to do. Thanks. Um, I think we're all set on uh, questions, at least that I'm aware of and uh, mindful of the time. Just a, a couple of quick comments. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our, uh, I think 14 or 15 panelists uh, for uh, both joining with us, going through a dry run yesterday uh, and sticking to the time allotments that we tried to have. So we feel very good about uh, that. Second, I'd like to just mention the team that uh, really participated in pulling this all together. Uh, uh, seven folks from ACORN, uh, you've heard from some of them, Ben Marks, Tom Dunn, uh, but also, uh, oh, and Susan Smiley, of course, but also Peter Carruthers, uh, Greg Paul, and our uh, incredible uh, coordinator, Mary Mester, who most of you have probably interacted with one way or another over the course of uh, completing the uh, the marketing and the uh, overall uh, subscription process. Uh, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, yeah. Ian. We recommend that you go to our website and go through some of it. It's fascinating. Just fascinating. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Ian Elbinson, who was responsible for the videos of the site that you saw and Sean Billups, who's behind the scene, but who is uh, recording all of this for uh, Neat TV. Uh, finally, uh, two key participants from Bristol who you've heard from are Richard Butts and uh, Sally Burrell, and they agreed from the beginning to be part of our weekly uh, team meetings to figure out how we were going to uh, represent and uh, interest uh, or attract uh, potential investors in the project. And they've both been 
uh, integral, if not essential, uh, parts of the team. So, so thank you to you folks. Uh, finally, um, on our website shortly after this, where shortly may be uh, a few days, there will be links to the two videos that you've seen, as well as a link to this entire program. And uh, we'll uh, uh, make that available to all of our Series B members. So Susan, I'm gonna pass it back to you for the final goodbye, <laughs> but uh, thanks, thanks to everyone. Thanks everyone for joining us today. We're gonna to close by uh, playing again uh, the, uh, the splendid video, uh, the video of this splendid project, the Bristol Community Solar Project. Looking west, here we are at the Bristol landfill site prior to solar array construction. Looking west again, you can see the access road and here is the construction staging area where equipment is being staged. At the top of the array, you can see racking starting to be assembled. These are form pans for the ballasted blocks that support the array. They function as the foundation because foundation piles cannot be driven into the landfill because the landfill cap cannot be penetrated. The crushed stone under the ballast pans allows us to level the pans. Here you have details of the pans as they're partially assembled, now with racking being assembled into the pan. The concrete will be poured into the pan and cast that vertical posts of the racking into the concrete. You can see how the posts go into the pan where the concrete will be poured. Now that we have some racking showing here, it's ready for being poured. And these are poured ballast blocks. Now, solar panels are being installed once the concrete is cured onto the racking. The racking assembly and the module installation were done in parallel to speed up the construction process. More modules being installed. and a good view of the size of the array. This is looking south and now west and now northwest and looking north. Here's detail of the underside of the array. You can see that the solar panels don't have a white backing. They actually are able to capture sun energy from behind the array as well as the front, because they are bifacial solar panels. This is the view of the backstop at the baseball diamond and its relation to the community.